Hi, David. How's it going? Hello, Michael. Hello. <laughs> Good to see you. Thanks. I love these chats. And we're going to have a little exploration. And this conversation was inspired by your exploration or curiosity around relationships and staying or going. Mm. I like what you wrote here in this email. Stay or go the skate, blah, blah, blah. The stay or go dilemma and how to navigate patiently, nimbly to be able to choose wisely. Mm. So maybe just what, what you want to kind of explain that or tell me what, what's going on with that, that kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Dive right in, Mike. Thank you. Yeah, let's um, do it. <laughs> I think for, for me, it comes from many times in my life, personally, being in a relationship and then getting to this excruciating place where I could not see clearly about what was going on. And there was some, you know, the honeymoon's over, <laughs> shit comes out, the con <laughs> conflicts are there, but there's this amazing person and they think I'm amazing. And there's a lot of love in the relationship and me being really confused and deeply conflicted about is this time to leave because it's getting more serious, more stakes on the table, or is it time to double down and go deeper? And in the past, I didn't even have the skills to go deeper, but I, I couldn't even figure out what that meant. You know, when there's that ambivalence, when there's that tension, when you're almost equally torn between staying or going, and then there's enormous judgment in the world. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> like, or you talk to your friend, you know, family member, whatever, they're going to really lean on one side. You go on social media, you're going to find people who, with all the confirmation bias, they're going to, you're going to find people who tell you, oh yeah, just follow your bliss, man. Just, if it doesn't feel right, get out. Yeah. Or, yeah. or oh, you're making a terrible mistake. You'll regret it for the rest of your life. You know, you're, commitment phobic you should stick it out and there's a lot of shooting and and even when you look at what some of the experts speak to attachment relationships there there's a sense that every person kind of staked out their this is what i did so now i recommend this to everybody kind of shtick and so for me this came out of years ago being married having a child owning property and and still feeling that ambivalence at times and not wanting to dump that on my wife but not wanting to to bury it because you can't be buried wanting to resolve it and do it in, and make a choice wisely and that's when I started to really explore the discernment of what it means and how do we navigate um, so it's not just two bad choices so the two bad choices are get the hell out you know, fall in love again and repeat <laughs> <laughs> or stay kind of just compromise, give in, resign yourself. And then either it implodes over the years because relationships are living organisms that need to be invigorated mm -hmm. and tended to. You can't just kind of go on autopilot. It'll either implode or you'll end up living together like roommates for the rest of your life. I didn't want that either. So I started looking at, well, what else is there? Because that's all I really knew. And that's when I started to, to talk to a lot of people about the discernment of it and to start to map it out and meet other men who were making other choices. And, and that's when it got, you know, got to be also confronting myself. What do I actually need to look at inside of me to be able to make a full wholesome choice, a choice where I listen to all the different emotions, instincts, intuitions, and then I make the best possible choice for me and for the people involved. And that doesn't mean that I'm gonna stay or go, it just, there's a way to do that, mm -hmm. you know? And so I've spent the last four or five years navigating that, making uh, free resources around that, and then um, and stepping into being a mentor, a guide, particularly with men, um, around their relationships. And sometimes it's other stuff too. Should I leave this city and move back to this other country? Should I leave this career? But it always comes down to the intimate realm also, you know? Um, do I continue being a lone wolf or do I, is it time 
to be in a pack, mm. all of that stuff. It's, it's, a, it's a primal developmental crisis that I, uh, I feel called to show up for, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, there's, there's so many <laughs> threads there. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I think I would start, I, uh, maybe I'll go from the beginning of what, as I was following along, the, the piece of the past and like past relationships prior to our current marital ones or more adult ones. Mm -hmm. um, I think I remember when I was 12, 13, I, I actually got into quite a committed, serious relationship really young <laughs> in wow. grade seven or grade eight. And I, I probably because I, there was a sense of not having that attachment from my family of origin, um, maybe, you know, who knows, but so I, it was probably also an unhealthy, I don't know, healthy, unhealthy, because the girl that I was with probably, you know, had her own things going on, but we spent a lot of time together and we were, I think we both longed for that genuine intimate attachment and this mm -hmm. relationship had a real impact on my life um we you know i lost my virginity to her i we dated probably for three or four years and she was the first one to ever tell me that my drug use was unhealthy <laughs> mm -hmm. and so it was a bit of a sidetrack but i just I always longed for mm. that connection. And, and as I got more dysfunctional, I guess, or I didn't build the skills to communicate and, and I was so young, so there's some mm. sort of, but that made it, I was incapable of maintaining that type of healthy relationship. Mm. And I kind of pushed her away and she did really care for me and I stayed friends with her for a very long time. Um, mm. And so then once I was detached from healthy, at the, even the potential for a healthy relationship, then I started yeah. dating many, you know, the, I got, I got into a incredibly toxic, unhealthy relationship because I was lusting after this girl who was like, you know, the hottest girl in the school. And that was a disaster for a few years. Terrible, terrible. Yeah. Uh, so then, you know, moving on. And I, I think I was always searching for, I'm a hopeless romantic, I think. And I was always searching for that longing. But I, until I, until I found myself, I guess you could say, or, or developed a relationship to myself, I was never going to, I was never going to be able to have a proper relationship with a, another person. Mm. Um, so that's the kind of the, my historical experience. I had lots of girlfriends, some serious, not some other, mm. but that ambivalence of wishing I had an answer, you know, like, mm -hmm. I just want to know, is this going to work? Is this the right person? Is it the right decision? Yeah. always having one foot in the door one foot out the door and that's just so not helpful but i think that's where a lot of people are yeah uh, yeah so that's sort of my initial oh wow mike thank you for taking me on that little journey of <laughs> <laughs> I, I it just what what comes up for me is is a couple of things like one is that there's a there's a real paradox to what you said near the end here about until I had a relationship with myself, I couldn't really show up and be in a, an intimate relationship. And on one level, that's so true. On another level, there's, there's like neuroscience that says you could be fucked up. You could be pretty dysfunctional and you could be in a loving, reciprocal, healthy relationship, which kind of that blew my mind. Cause I always use that, that justification to leave. Oh, I'm so fucked up. Right, I right, got issues, right, man. Right. Oh, I can't do this. <laughs> I gotta go. Bye. You know. Um, yeah. So there's that piece, right? Like you're, yeah. you're, you're. There's truth in that, and then there's also a caveat. We For can sure. learn. We yeah. can learn to be in relationship, even when we're messed up. We don't have to wait till we've healed everything, right. and we've figured right. ourselves right. out, and we found ourselves. 
that that is my that's one of my um, shadows that I had to face. You know, I had this like lone wolf. If it doesn't feel right, if it doesn't feel 100%, if I if I'm not up to it, I don't if it's not familiar, it must be I got to go. I got to be alone for a while. I got to be a monk in the wilderness. Really, yeah. I really um, like that. Sorry, I'm getting distracted by. Yeah. Finger. I'll wait for you to come so back. I have like, yeah, I have yeah. a little like nail file with my thumb. Right. Yeah. Crazy. Uh -oh. Okay. Sorry. Ah. Uh, <laughs> sorry. You were saying about the lone wolf. No, I really like the paradox yeah. of the, yeah. So, sorry. Go on. So, so there's that side. And then there's another myth or spell. I think of them as spells, like society, childhood. We get these spells that we believe that cause us a lot of harm. And it, one of the spells is, oh, when I meet the one, yeah, I'm just going to know. It's going to feel right. And it's always going to feel right. And if you really, I think, you know, if you're honest with yourself, I've had that several times in my life and then later go, what the fuck? I hate this. I hate this person. I hate this job. I hate this thing. I want to get out of here. It's wrong. I was wrong. But I forget that, right? I forget that moment where it felt right. Mm. And so there's, there's that piece too, of we're all going to fade out of love. That feeling of infatuation in loveness will always go away. Just like other things go away. If I'm, if I'm full and I've satiated, I feel great. Mm, yum, yum, yum. That goes away and then I'm hungry again. Um, it's a temporary state. So then it makes us have to if if we i was chasing that and i think some people have labeled that love addiction you know when you're chasing mm. after that feeling of being in love my friends used to make fun of me that like i'd be like oh i found her the one oh my god you gotta meet her and they're like uh-huh yeah it's only been three months and you said that last 10 times you know and uh it may you know i kind of shooed them off but after a while i started to realize that the in loveness would fade faster like a drug I think there's also this sense too that even I think I don't know if you had this fantasy that you know we're going to meet this person that fulfills all my needs all my longings every time I have uh, the tenderest feeling they're going to be right there going oh honey I feel you I'm with you I'm right here I'm laughing at every joke you make I'm crying with every tear you have you know like um and I'm challenging you in ways that you don't mind and then you get, and when we get, we get into real deep water of intimacy. We realize that's such a lie. Yeah. Right. We get confronted by loving people in ways we hate. And we go fucking kill you because you said that because it, yeah. because it exposes our shadow. That's what people who love us do. They confront us and we don't want, we don't like it. We attack them back. Uh, we're going to have times where we're all alone in the relationship. And that doesn't mean there's something wrong. It just means that person's not at our beck and call available 24 seven. They have their own stuff going on. <laughs> I, it's just so much disillusion that's happened for me over the years that I've started to see that part of this discernment to gain clarity, to make a proper choice as best as we can with the unknown being you know our life isn't written is actually at least half of the work is dismantling all of these spells breaking out of the spells noticing the lies we've told ourselves since we were little and actually stepping closer to real love whatever that is you know just getting closer to that and i think of you and your mindfulness practice and sobriety is a similar process right of, of unveiling taking noticing and taking off those veils that um that just so addictively sounds so fucking good and then we realize that's what's causing me to have this pattern in my life is believing these lies yeah. what would it be like if i just let that put that aside didn't even let it go but just didn't believe it so hard and then and then i think we start to actually begin to ask the right questions you know, we start to actually be in the terrain, noticing what's really around us and what's ahead of us and start to um, really start to know.
I think that, oh, just so nice just to listen. Um, the thing you said, uh, the fantasy, so I being often reminded, I'd say, so the, that girl I mentioned in high school, the second one who was the hottest person, but also the most fucked up, mm. which is probably why I was drawn to them, obviously. And I was in love with the fantasy of what I thought this person would do for me. Right. And I think that was always in some ways the problem in some sense was I just, I was always in relationship with the fantasy rather than the reality. And it was like, yeah. well, if it can just be like this, that's okay. That's what I want. I'll be fixed. But <laughs> it's like this and I'm so resistant and just incapable or was for so long of accepting that fact. Yeah. And I would say, I really like what you said too about the you don't have to be healed and fixed to, to have a, a good relationship because i do i think that's totally true and i would say <laughs> maybe maybe it was on one end of the spectrum but i think when i got married i would also say i think i was more mature and i always when i was a kid my dream my dream was to you know, when they said, what do you want to be when you grow up? I always said, I want to be a dad. I always wanted to be a dad. Wow. And I, yeah, it was so interesting. I don't know. How, anyway, I mean, I, I have a good dad, I think. And so um, I, and I had it in my head that I was going to be married and have a kid by at 30 years old. I don't have no idea where that came from, probably from the societal brainwashing, et cetera. But so when I, started dating Nikki I, I think I was still in relationship with that fantasy in some sense and I thought okay Nikki is a girl or a woman she's organized she's got her life together all the things that I didn't have she mm. so I, I did there was a part of it part of it that was real and part of it was fantasy part of it was yes she does have a lot of these wonderful qualities that most of my intimate partners or, or I'd say like serious relationships from the past did not have and other so I, I sort of thought those were wonderful this is a good person to get married to and then it, yeah. also on the other side of my head it was maybe the illusion that this was going to fix me or solve my problems mm -hmm. and then after we got married it was clear <laughs> my problems weren't going away and then that's when all the work, the hard work started was when I started sobered up and got, started getting help. And yeah. And so to your point about, we don't need to be fixed ourselves, so to speak, um, to have good relationships. That was certainly true for that situation. Mm -hmm. And through relationship, we have both grown so much. Hmm we're still here together we're still married we have two kids mm. um many years of struggle but um here we are and things seem to be pretty good so i i think also to the point of this conversation i think there's a lot of good experience that i've had and actually lessons i've learned from other people that helped me get through all that darkness yeah. um, both personally and in relationships that's wonderful to hear, Mike, that you've been in the river of love together <laughs> and, and, and it's, it's, it takes you somewhere, right? You, you've changed, yeah. you've grown because of yeah. the relationship. Yes. Um, that's the, to me, that's the profound thing about any relationship is uh, even when you separate, if you, if you keep that person in your heart and you're faithful to the connection that's really there, because we're not, you know, the, this whole idea of a marriage is so artificial. A monogamous box is really artificial. We have so many desires that cannot be met in that box. Mm. Uh, we need community. We, we, we want to love people in so many ways and be loved in so many ways. And not one person can't meet that in, in that box. And in many cultures in history, they, that's why they didn't even have that box. You know, you might co-parent, but you might have many wives or many husbands or 
uh, some cultures, they just interlope because they recognize that, that one person is not enough. Uh, and it's not fair to dump that expectation on the, yeah, that person. Uh, it's not even fair to dump that on society, right? There's, there's, a, there's a dance here, but to be able to stay on a journey with one person, to de- you know, and to not just be on autopilot, not be asleep at the wheel, but to keep growing and growing through conflict and good times and bad and, and all of that, that's a beautiful thing. That's a, that's a gift that I'm appreciating you have and you've tended to that gift. It doesn't just happen automatically because you stay. It happened Ooh. because you, you've committed and recommitted and yeah. right, um, yeah. and it's a beautiful thing. And I think as I think the closest some people get it to that is being a parent. You just decide as a parent, I'm sticking around. I hate them right now. Oh man, they drive me crazy. But I'm not going to leave. I could leave, and some parents do, and I'm not going to judge that. But to to just commit to the tending of a relationship over time, and re- relax also over time with who that person's supposed to be. Mm-hmm. who I thought they were and actually discover them every day go wow oh uh, uh, there's a psychologist Stan Tatkin that I really appreciate the psychobiology approach to couples therapy pact he talks about the neuroscience and one of the things he talks about is implicit memory when we're with somebody uh, we just develop a, ma- a map of who they are and that's for convenience. Like it's what you do with roommates, with friends, with work. Mm-hmm. You know, when you're driving to work, you have a map. You don't have to think about yeah. it. So we do that with relationships too. And what's beautiful about that is then you can anticipate and guess and not have to, you can multitask and do many things. <laughs> but what's bad about that is that it takes away that spark, that passion, that aliveness. It puts us to sleep. Oh, I know you. Oh, now you, you disagree with me. You rolled your eyes. And ha- more than half the time, we're not actually accurate. Or we're maybe we're accurate to who they were a month ago or a year ago. Yeah, they used to have a problem with that. But now I look in her eyes and I see she's trying to meet me halfway. Wow. We used to fight about this. And now she's really trying to hear me. Wow. What a beautiful moment that is. Mm. But in my mind map, I don't even look at her face. I just hear her go, oh, sigh. And I think, oh, she. I don't want to talk about it. And I walk away. You know, there's so much happens in micro moments between a couple, right? And yeah. so I'm just amazed by that. When people choose to stick together and choose to grow, what a beautiful thing. Um, ah, yeah, what a gift it is to the world, especially as you raise kids, for them to see you go through that dance together dance of being close and sometimes stepping away from each other sometimes being at odds sometimes having different ways of being but being aligned sometimes not you know it's it's a it's a powerful thing i i want to ask you about because i this idea of and i don't know much about this so i'm curious what you think just around sort of monogamous relationships, how we've, I know, I don't even know how much clarity we have on how we were tribally and et cetera, and et cetera. Um, Because I think there's a fantasy there too. And there's an excuse there too, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, humans didn't evolve to be monogamous. Therefore, what am I doing in a marriage? Therefore, blah, 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 blah. Oh yeah. Um, and yeah, and I think that that is unhelpful a lot of the time for people. Right. And at the same time, there's a, there's truth in some sense to some of that, as far as I understand that kind of, as you alluded to, although I, it just doesn't seem like a, I guess we are in the world we're in today, monogamous marriages or are seem to be the sort of societal norm if you will Mm -hmm. there's obviously pros and cons to that and what i am relatively clear on is that even if there were monogamous relationships raising kids was not the sole job of the two parents 
Yeah. Which I think you also alluded to as well, which, which I do think part of our current societal ills and perhaps family ones are the fact that mm -hmm. the, the, the single family dwelling has become so common and that is problematic or difficult. Yeah. And so anyhow, those are, cause I, this sort of, I do think it's a bit of an illusion or a fantasy that yeah. people get lost in. And I think I did too at times. Oh, we're not supposed to be monogamous or whatever. Why don't we just have multiple partners or why did we even get married? Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, that's yeah. sort of, I'm just curious what you think about all that. And Well, you know. I have a, I have a lot of friends who are in polyamorous relationships. I'm not an expert, but earlier in my life, I had this sort of opportunity to explore different ways of being. And I, yeah. I when I was younger, I found it, uh, you know, if, if one-on-one -on -one intimacy was hard, deep water i found this was like the ocean i was like oh my god i'm i'm getting eaten alive here the yeah. the uh, the amount of um it it could be liberating and wonderful to love two or three people together and to all do it consciously but yeah you know people are still people there's going to be jealousy there's going to be now i have to manage three or four intimate relationships i have a hard enough time managing one <laughs> <laughs> i think i think i think we're not ready for it i don't think i think what you uh broach about the larger communal frame that's what we're missing that's why mm -hmm. when people try to explore outside of monogamy they often feel the same thing they feel isolated um you know they feel left out there's also like intimate dynamics let's say you have three people who love each other you know if you've ever watched even children play if one two kids play it can be okay if four kids play, it can be okay. But as soon as you have three, it's really hard. One always feels left out. You know, you know that doesn't go away because you're 20 or 30 or 40 or you've read all the books about polyamory and you're open and against monogamy. We're still human. So I think that itself presents a lot of problems and challenges that some people are ready to meet and mm -hmm. be in that terrain. And I applaud that to be able to love people really openly and be really transparent and your communication to be impeccable. And then shit will still come up and you deal with it and you're committed to dealing with it with more than one person. Wow. Good for you. The world needs more love, mm -hmm. right? Uh, when people are loved, they're kinder. They contribute more to society. They're healthier. They, why not? So, um, yeah, but I understand you're also like, it can be an excuse um, that we use to avoid. There's a, there's a real pattern in our world of avoiding intimacy, avoiding ourselves, avoiding others. With this pandemic, it's, it's become amplified. I can just commodify everything. I can pay for everything. I don't even have to go and meet people face to face anymore. <laughs> I don't have to be uncomfortable with my, you know, yeah someone, someone at the store i just they leave it there and i don't even see them there that we're going into this realm where we're becoming more anxious more separated from each other um which oh god th this what you know what's hopeful to me actually is that over the last few decades you have people like esther perel talking about um desire in relationship you know, and, and normalizing it. You have people like David Brooks, a conservative, talking about the failure of the nuclear family. It's not just some left-wing, you know, uh, fantasy of how we used to be, blah, blah. But everybody's recognizing that the burden of two people raising a child is just, is, is too, is impossible, right? Mm. And going, sending them to school and then just the two people raising them is just not enough. We hunger for more. We need aunties and uncles and seniors and elders in our life. And we need peers of different ages to be around, to model for us. So we live in a patchwork kind of world where there's enormous wealth, but there's a lot of dysfunction and disconnect emotionally and on a human level. And then we're just trying to love each other in that world, right? Hmm. So I think... I, I would prefer to dismantle all the shoulds and 
on one hand, the things you're supposed to do or you should do. And on the other hand, those fantasies that people have. You go live in a commune up north or in the islands of BC with hippies, you're still going to have conflicts and intimacy issues over there. People are still people. Yeah. There's still avoidance. They're still selfish. There's still, there's still stuff that will come up with any human beings in any place you go on this earth, right? Uh, yeah, it, it brings up a lot of questions, you know? So then what is, what is our heart really longing for and what can be met with one person in an intimate context? Uh, I don't, I, I don't pretend to have the answer for it, like some stock answer. Well, all men seek this and all women seek that. That's BS. What I prefer mm -hmm. though, is I do prefer mapping out the terrain. So not just telling people, what do you think? Most people don't even know where to look. When you ask them, what do they want? What do you want from your mm -hmm. partner? They don't even have the words, especially men. They don't even have the words. Well, you know, when you're hungry, you know, when you're tired, but <laughs> they don't know they don't know what the emotional needs are the psychological or physical i want sex that's all they know I, I, she's not giving me sex that's often a complaint but that, that's not really what they need you know yeah so that's like the stock that's the stock i that's what i think i should want so i'm just going to say that's what i want kind of thing right that that yeah. is so true that is so true it's just like with emotions we as men we're culturated to get angry because that's powerful, right? That protects you. That pushes it out there. It's someone else's fault. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. we use, sometimes we use anger for everything. I'm irritated. I'm angry, but I'm actually anxious. I'm sad. I'm, I'm longing for something. So mm -hmm. I, I found it really helpful for myself to start to study different systems and learn what the, what the needs are. And, and, and then knowing the, the needs that human beings have it's like a map to understanding every person in every moment. What's really going on underneath the surface of the ocean here is there's a current. Oh, this person's talking a lot about blah, 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 but they're really needing attention right now. Oh, that person is really touchy feely and they're, they're standing off to the side like they've been rejected. <laughs> they want to be, you know, they want to feel connected. They want to feel like they belong. It's not rocket science. Even animals exhibit a lot of the same core needs as humans. And, and then when, when you start to see ourselves in that way, as hungry, hungry for this food, then it, the game is really exciting because it's about how do I get my needs met? How do I get the finest food to fulfill my needs? You know? And I think that, I wish that we taught that in kindergarten. And we were taught to put up our hand when we need to go pee. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're not we're, we're not even taught to listen to our bodies when we're hungry yeah right we're yeah. we have we're regimented from an early age here eat you got to eat now you got to eat this that i think you should eat now instead of hey do you feel that feeling what do you need right now do you need carbs or protein or, or vegetables or fruit and actually start to discern and regulate our own self like nourish our own self and then, then we can start to be in relationship with others because then it's all about my needs, your needs, working together. I can't meet all of your needs, but maybe I can help support you so you get more nourished every day. And then the more nourished you are, the more you want to stick around. Mm -hmm. you know? And we both want to nourish each other, but nourish ourselves. And the larger world uh, is a place to get nourishment to. It presents... Um, when you get out of the binary black and white kind of rules of marriage and all that, then there's this incredible world, this wilderness of discovery that I just, the last five years, I've started to navigate and map out, but you know, I I'd want everybody, especially men to understand it. Cause they seem to be, <laughs> men seem to be the, the least aware of that terrain, but the most hungry for, you know, at this moment, that I see and, and looking for direction also. I, one thing that's encouraging is that in the last five years, because maybe because of Me Too and, and that context, one wonderful thing is there used to be like two or three men's groups that had any, in my view, had any worth or salt. And now there's hundreds and some of them are amazing. They're empowering men to communicate their needs and practice mm -hmm. intimacy and be better fathers and husbands and partners. 
And some of them actually are not. Some of them capitalize on this uncertainty and lack of knowing the self and just tell men, here, do this. This is what a man needs. Now there's a million of us preaching this Bible and men are swallowing it up because they're, they're confused. They're desperate. They're wondering, why am I lonely? Why does no, you know, why can't I succeed in this world? Why does, why is it that I can't be intimate? Well, I got to follow some rules. So they're, they're searching for some playbook, some, mm. some new rules to replace what they think, you know, is, is evil or bad. It's just feminism and women have misled them. So now they have men leading them. They're, they're looking for the same kind of box, just a new box, you know, but still a box. So for me, it's been more about offering a compass and say, let's go explore. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to find, but I have a way for you to figure out where we are and where you need to go. So, you know, let's go there. Mm -hmm. um, that to me is exciting and, and, and beautiful work, you know, is to help empower. And I think in your way, you're doing that with mental health, right? You're helping people to navigate and figure out with all these labels and all these different supports out there and stigma, how do we navigate and be true to ourselves and come to know ourselves and, and develop integrity and soulfulness and mindfulness in this world where a lot of times people are just trying to sell us stuff that they think we need, but we don't always, it's not our path, right? Yeah. I'm just writing down a note here so I don't forget. Yeah, I think uh, so much there. Um, I'm just balancing kind of being a, uh, I don't know what it would be, uh, enjoying just listening with think, kind of balancing the questions and the things I want to reflect on. Yeah. Um, so some of the things you said around getting clarity on what it is we even need or, or even want. So needs and wants and mm. these, these sort of maps of how you, you spoke about sort of the map of, of the partner and the relationship, um, which was interesting too. So I think in the beginning, or at least I think we're not also taught to even ask what it is that we want or need. Mm -hmm. it's, pause it's kind of we're on autopilot being directed into what we think we need or just there's sort of this un, uh, unwritten expectation that we're just going to know where we're going how to get there what we want and then it's supposed to happen i think it's i think it's more i don't i hate to sound nefarious or nihilistic but i think it's it's more um intentional I think as we raise children, if you look at how children are raised still, and Noam Chomsky spoke about this recently, it's a compliance system. It benefits us as a, as a society to keep children and, and even adults unaware of their own desires, because then we can ma manipulate them towards what we want them to do, to vote for this, to go over here, to finish this school, to go into this trade. Uh, that benefits us, right? on a certain level it's a way of controlling if a person doesn't know themselves deeply right then you can fill them up with all these ideas and you can see you know it's not rocket science to look at someone's face and go oh you're sad and you feel left out look you're sitting there everyone's over here in the party okay and if i want to control you then i will sell you something that makes you feel like you belong and then i'm your best friend you'll do whatever i say right I mean, it's terrible to say that, but I think in a lot of ways, our social structures are built for coercion and compliance, conformity, right? Maybe on some level, there, it, it's not a evil, there's no evil intent. It's just like, it's how society tries to be cohesive, right? Right, right, yeah. yeah. But, but on another level, it's like, why don't we empower kids to, to know themselves? Well, because then they, half the time, they wouldn't listen to our freaking lectures. And they would walk out of the classroom and say, ah, I'm not interested in this. This is boring. And they would go outside and play. They would, they would make stuff, build stuff. They would be harder to manage. Right? They would, they would question us even more. That's why we try to stamp that out of kids as a society pretty early on. 
And, you know, if you look at class systems too, the richest kids go to the richest schools. I've been to those schools. I've taught and visited those schools. They learn all about leadership and management from an early age. They learn about critical thinking, knowing yourself, understanding other people so you can manipulate and influence them. That's what they learn. You go to middle class and lower class schools, lower class schools, they're taught just conformity, line up, shut up, punish, you know, um, middle class schools are taught about personal responsibility and being a good citizen, and, you know, taking care of other people, blah, blah, blah. But they're not taught to question the system and to start their own things and do their own, make their own mark in the world and influence the larger world, right? So we, we even have that in our social structure. We only want a certain percentage of people to have self-awareness and freedom. And that's the, those people, the richest people, and everyone else has to fit into this, these boxes. So I think it's important to remember the larger context because if we don't, we can start to think there's something wrong with us. You know, why am I not, why don't I have initiative? Why don't I chase after things? Well. It's not because you're not motivated. I've never met an unmotivated person. It's because of all of these conditionings that we have, that we have to break out of these spells and awaken to ourselves. And that there's tools to do that. You know, There's tools to get to know who we really are, what we really want. And one of the most efficient and fastest ways in relationship, because you're with somebody, they get to see you up close and they get to tell you, oh, why are you so nervous about that? Why are you embarrassed about that? Hey, I see you, I see you, you're here. And that's confronting, right? That's scary. Because you're like, I don't know, I have all this conditioning. I didn't know I was hiding all these emotions, especially for men. They're so, they're so used to hiding emotions at work and with their buddies that when they meet someone who's actually gonna be intimate with them, it's terrifying. Because they see their, you know, all their insecurities, all their tender spots. They could hurt you. They could humiliate you. They could reject you. But when we start to learn what, that, what those emotions mean, all those core needs, then we start to feel like, oh, wow. I have a Rosetta Stone to understand humanity, myself and others. And if I feel vulnerable or embarrassed, so does everybody else, or so do a lot of people. And here's why. Here's what I can do to help them feel better and help me feel better. You know, mm -hmm. um, so I get really excited about that piece to give that kind of uh, information out in a way freely so that particularly men can start to understand their partners, their kids, themselves, uh, relax into become more whole, not try to be two dimensional, because that always leads to enormous conflict. I try to be responsible or kind or anything. But if it's two-dimensional, that, that really causes a lot of conflict internally, right? Well, what if I try to be a good guy, a generous father, and I feel selfish at this moment? Oh, that's bad. I feel ashamed. Well, well wait a second. Maybe there's, there's good in that too. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to turn into Donald Trump or be a jerk, but I can, I can be like looking out for me. Hey, maybe my, my daughter might need to learn that from me too, right? It's okay to grab and seize life. Take what you need. Just don't take everything from everybody else. There's, a, there's stuff to learn here. Uh, so then, you know, it just feel, to me, it's an infinite path of learning and growth that never ceases to be wondrous and exciting. Once you, once you understand how this terrain is, you know, how the human mind and human heart works, you can't, I can't stop exploring. Yeah. I, I have so many things that you said. <laughs> I think <laughs> I want to cover just the idea, which I mm -hmm. think I've, my, I've evolved my understanding of this idea. Like we think there's, well, it can be easy to think there's sort of people behind the screen pulling strings and coercing society and manipulating this and that and i think there's some modicum of truth in that but i don't think not in the way that we want to simplify and make them you know yeah. i think oh yeah you you mentioned it too there is the cohesive like 
there is a need for cohesiveness. And part of that is, I don't know, maybe it is stomping out some of the, I don't mm -hmm. know, yearning for creativity or pushing the boundaries and so on right. and so forth. So, so there's this interesting yeah. balance there. Yeah. What, so what were you so going to say? I prefer to think about it as a paradox that's worth worth exploring, right? Like, and I think this gets to the intimate and to the societal realm. If you think about independence and codependence, for example, uh -huh. right? you think about this on a social, larger macro level, it's like, hey, the nanny state, you should be taking care of everybody who's got any problem. Right, right. Or, hey, it's the libertarian, fuck you, you're all on your own, get a gun and have your ranch, right? Those are the extremes. <laughs> and we, we see that in the world. We see whole yep. countries organized around one or the other or struggling with back and forth between this, may some people even call it the hyper-masculine, hyper-feminine or the, the more extreme toxic elements of both, right? Yeah, yeah. And on an intimate level, it's independent, codependent. I think both are spells and lies. Uh, in nature, you see that. You, you see that the both are actually in paradox, right? There's no such thing as an independent being on this planet or in this yeah, universe. Yeah, yeah. It's, right. it's a delusion yeah. of, gran of grandeur, right? To think that I, I'm a self-made man. <laughs> I built this yeah, billion yeah. dollar company with my own two hands. Yeah. That's such <laughs> bullshit. And, totally. and, and there's no such thing as pure codependence either though, right? Like when you actually study, and this blew my mind because I'm more on the independent realm. Like, you know, I spent most of my life as a man trying to become more independent. I thought that was a goal until I realized it was causing harm to me right. and the world around me. But when you study the neuroscience, like Stan Tatkin, you start to see like, there's a, actually a realm of healthy relationship that might sometimes look codependent. A, a couple being in a bubble together where they prioritize those two people prioritize each other above everything else, including their children. That sounds kind of codependent. Ooh, because we live in a very independent society, North America, right? So, ooh, that sounds code. But wait, if you actually come closer to it, you look at it and go, well, actually, those two people have individuated and are doing a lot of things in their own way that they're supporting each other. So, there's this paradox of codependence, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. independence, and the real place of health is interdependence i know that my survival and my happiness depends on you existing in this world right and on me having a relationship with nature that's healthy and with my neighbors and with my society if we start in that healthy realm then there's a lot of room for me to be myself and to grow and develop but if we go into no there's no such thing as society and nature's just there for me to rape and pillage and my body's there to be used like a machine. If we go into that in hyper independent mindset, I'm going to die younger with more disease, maybe with more money hidden under my, you know, thing, <laughs> but that's where, and I'm going to probably have more divorce in my future. Right. And if I just sit around blaming the government, which, you know, yelling at the government for not saving me from all of my troubles and, acting like a kid who should be getting his cake and not having to do any chores. It's a problem with that too, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think we see that also. We see that, that kind of like the extremes. We have a rare times do we actually see the healthy paradox, uh, which to me isn't even a balance, but it's, it's a place where both of those kind of fall apart and something else is in the middle. It's like the third way in Buddhism, right? Uh, it's like it, an integration i think something like that like yeah. that word seems to fit instead of clinging or avoiding i'm in it yeah and that's a whole yeah. new that's a whole different paradigm right and when i try to reveal that to parents or couples uh people in relationship they kind of look at me and they they kind of know it but they don't know it we we don't see it a lot we see the extreme edges outside of that and that's what we're often arguing about. Ah, I think you're too this and you're too clingy and you're too independent. And then we, we're not actually looking at, you know, towards a place that's actually healthy. We're both looking outwards to the worst places, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
So what you're speaking to kind of leads me to that place, right? And once you start even just looking in that direction, you start to find a lot of exciting stuff. You start to find people doing it, communities practicing it. You start to see examples of couples in your life who live like that, who are very strong in their individuality, but extremely loving and generous with each other. How does that work? Your brain starts to kind of bend, right? Like, how did how did they get there oh no they weren't always like that they went through phases where they broke up or they they fought or they had to work through um to birth that paradigm they had to evolve right. into that place yeah. you know you see educational systems that are aspiring and actually practicing that you start to see it but it's not it's not the norm it's not the dominant structure of how society works so you you know it's not special or better or it's just, it's there, but we don't often see it. You know, we, if you look at your street and you see a neighbor who's the drunk, who's always causing a scene and you see this, the other one who's like a saint, who's always rescuing cats from the street. And that's all you see. Those are the extremes, but you don't see the, the quiet family next to you. That's very loving and strong and caring, but knows when to say no and doesn't create drama. Right. You don't notice that. Um, and I think that's what I wish we were studying more, you know, healthy ecosystems, healthy families, yeah. healthy governments, healthy leadership. It's not always exciting or sexy from afar. When you get closer to it, though, it is really exciting. It's like, wow, this, these people are remarkable. They're responsible, but they're having tons of fun. They're creative, but they're getting shit done. You know, like what? What if we start looking for those paradoxes, you know, in our mm -hmm. lives and we start noticing that we, we can embody those paradoxes too. And we can learn from each other um, ways that we, you know, someone close to us might do it even better. So we can learn from each other and go, wow, how do you do that? I, I so um, I think one thing is maybe we're evolving through this, but we are so much more focused and drawn to negative information so that we avoid it that's sort of that survival instinct mm. and i do there is a need to cultivate our awareness of these more positive things and to cherish them more and to promote them more but I, i'll butcher how we said it yuval harari put it so nicely like mm. good experiences just aren't interesting for us because they're we're we're not wired that way in some sense our body is not drawing us towards those things in a way that's probably where it could be or where we might want it to be to live into more of those things you're saying yeah um, i wish i could say it more eloquently yeah. i want to though we have, i can't believe how long we've been talking for already <laughs> i want to take it back to the individual relationship mm. thing because mm -hmm. that's sort of where we started and the question of, I'm curious what you think, because I think it's helpful to one talk about it and also for people to listen is, yeah. how do you navigate the decision to stay or go? And and maybe just some examples of what, what that, how that looked for you. And then, yeah. Yeah. So it, it, the answer isn't short, but I'll try to kind of give you the yeah. highlights, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. So for me there's certain layers like peeling the layers and there's a there's a famous myth from greek uh greek mythology of theseus and the and the underworld the labyrinth going to rescue his love from the minotaur and i found that myth really helpful because it's when we are in that dilemma it's like we're underground we don't see clearly we don't see what's really real we're buried in our worst instincts, we're most insecure. When one person is in a relationship and they're signaling that they're uncertain, it makes both people really insecure. Mm. So you start to play out all these dynamics. You still see the worst in them and yourself and it reinforces is I gotta get out of here, I'm trapped, right? And Theseus had to go into the underground, into this labyrinth that was designed to trap you and kill you. And if you got to the center, you'd have to face the Minotaur who rips people apart and eats them for breakfast, right? <laughs> it's a great analogy. So, <laughs> yeah. so um, you cannot use your mind 
You cannot use your preconceived what relationships should be. You cannot use your, your maps. Your underground, it's dark. You're hitting walls. You have to backtrack a lot. You're second guessing, you're second guessing, you're second guessing. Like everything is like, you know, uh, and you're at your worst. You're, you're most cranky, exhausted, stressed, and it should not be making a life, big life decision. One of the mm -hmm. most consequential big life decisions. Um, what you need is you need some allies and you, you need a map. You need some guidance. You need a compass. And so mm. that's what a lot of the tools that I provide are helping men understand the core needs that drive them to, towards behaving in certain ways. Unless you understand your partner's core needs, understand where your wounds are, that feeling inside that says, I got to get the hell out of here, or I have to stay. If I don't stay, I'm terrible person who deserves to die or who's uh, right. subhuman when you understand your your wounds and the, the emotions that drive you then you can start to address them for the first time sometimes when you start to address them they become milder less intense and the emotions of negative like shame jealousy fear uh guilt those start to not just subside but they start to transform Guilt can turn into integrity. Shame can turn into showing up, being more authentic, saying the things that are going to be embarrassing but need to be said, right? Fear can turn into freedom, excitement, courage. Um, grief can turn into gratitude and joy. Mm. So you start to uh, develop these powers, these allies. So now, you, now you're alone no more. You're in the underworld. And there's a famous um, elder who spoke to initiating men, right? In different cultures, where part of an initiation for men at different ages is to make them face their worst. Because what they wanted to do in the village was to make sure that that guy had some salt, that we could count on him. He's not gonna fall apart under stress. So yeah. they would throw them into stress, into the woods for 10 days, starve them, bury them underground. They would freak the hell out of them, right? And some of them died. And that was necessary for that, for that village to stay strong, is to test the men. And part of that initiation was always to take them to their edge of their own worst fears. Mm -hmm. And one of the men in this initiation was going through it. He failed. He came back. And then he kind of shook, shook himself and said, okay, I'm going to do it again. I, I really am going to do it this time. I'm determined. And the elder stepped in and said, no, you're going to fail again. Because look, you're not doing anything different. And... We don't, we're not going to let you do it because you're going to die. And he got really discouraged. And then finally he said, well, what is it going to take? And he said, well, your demon, your worst parts of you are stronger than the best parts of you right now. So you having more attitude, more confidence, more belief doesn't mean shit. The only way you can defeat an adversary is if you have more friends. The winner is the one with more friends. So that's, that's a huge piece of this. If you're alone mm -hmm. trying to solve this, you're going to fail. You're going to go to your, even if you come up with some beautiful rationalization that your spiritual self told you to leave or stay and everything was all okay in the end and da, da, da. Okay, maybe there's truth in that, but you also, you know, you, you probably are repeating in that same pattern you've done a dozen times. So part of it is to resource yourself, to, to face your worst fears, understand what's actually driving you process those emotions far enough that they're not blocking you right so you can see clearer and you're not in your own way have more allies at your side so when i work with men i don't i work with them myself and i bring in other coaches and mentors and bring them into groups so they can see themselves reflected and supported by other men they realize they're not alone that this dilemma is kind of ancient and primal. All of us have to have it at some point in our life, whether it's about becoming a parent, you know, owning property, moving to another country, a relationship, change of career. We're all going to face that where our worst fears come in and confuse us. And then you got to face that minotaur. And those are all the, all the pieces of us that sabotage intimacy and love and authenticity but at that stage you've already you're resourced you know yourself pretty well you've got your your wounds are not you know bleeding out and and 
um, sore and, and exposed, you're, you're tending to yourself and you know where you're headed and you're prepared and then you can wrestle with that part of yourself. For me, it was the lone wolf was one of them. Another one was the critic that anytime I got close to somebody, I wanted to rip them to rip them apart. Because if I didn't rip them apart, they would rip me apart. I learned that intimacy meant ripping somebody apart, mm. finding their flaws so they couldn't fuck me over. So I have to face that, that I have a critic that wants to destroy and pick apart everything. I have a, a lone wolf that wants to run away at the first sign of discomfort. And then, I, you know, and then there's other parts. I think of the, the victim, the fixer, and the pleaser. Those are the five main saboteurs that I've seen with hundreds and hundreds of men and boys. That's what they talk about. That's what they get down to. That's what's really in the way. Uh, and we face that. And then what you can't do is you can't actually kill the minotaur. In the actual story, he has to kill the minotaur. You can't kill a part of yourself. You have to grow it up. So that part of me that used to be a lone wolf that was always on the edge of groups and, and always you know, wanting to look for the exit, that part of me is the part of me that lives adventure and fun. So when the family is boring and, and I want to leave, I bring my family with me. We go on an adventure. If the relationship is getting stale and boring, I want to invigorate it. I want to bring in something uh, new and exciting, shake things up be edgy. I need that, right? I need that for my relationship to actually thrive. So that, that, you know, and the critic is the part of me that, that sees through bullshit and is able to see underneath what's really going on. And, and he's become more skillful at not attacking and blaming, but more just bringing it up. So it doesn't cause problems later, you know? Mm -hmm. So we, we can learn all of that. That's the beautiful thing is that we can, we can heal our wounds. We can learn about all of our emotions. We can study and learn with other men, all these ways we can evolve our patterns relationally. And I think it's beautiful work. And, you know, the, the outcome of that is that we end up then creating more intimacy in our life, whether we stay or go. And sometimes there's reasons where you actually need to go, you know, uh, it's really valid and, and it's a good thing and it's going to be ultimately even better for the kids sometimes mm -hmm. and sometimes you thought with every fiber of your being you thought you had to leave and then you realize with now with support now with healing the pieces of you that were really raw you start to realize oh damn this is a whole new chapter of my life I don't you know I'm walking each new step for the first time like being a parent but that's also part of intimacy is walking into the unknown together. So it's, it's a, it's an exciting thing. It's, it's, it starts off extremely painful and charged and the stakes couldn't be higher. And often men just are at war with themselves and it can get to a place where you're in a, you're in a new chapter of your life. There's a new paradigm. Everything is more vi vibrant and alive than it ever was. And all those old boxes and spells seem less and less um, true and things that we don't need to hold on to anymore. Nice. Hope I did uh, that. You know, I didn't go yeah. too long there. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm just curious how much time you have. Are you? I can go uh, like okay. another 10, mi more. 10 minutes or so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think I'm going to try to uh, map on for, yeah, map on, I guess, my experience to what you're sort of talking about. I think mm. the primary thing I, I think is the, you need a team or you need allies, you need people around you to support you. you can, I, I think that seems to be the most well one it's not always easy to find those people and two mm -hmm. i think we're just somewhat inherently wired to just think we should or can do it alone and i see a lot of people struggle with that and so i think when i when when all the cards are on the table with my wife 
trying to navigate through that, I think I'd say one thing that is the biggest barrier or one of the biggest barriers is stress tolerance or emotion regulation or that aversion. Like we just, people are so averse to sitting with discomfort and the unknown that it's so much easier to run away. So that's my impulse was always run away, run away, run away. Mm. And <laughs> having to deal with that was helpful. Just trying to bring myself back as much as I could. Mm -hmm. Getting support both for us as a couple and also individually. I think so that was sort of the foundation was getting as many people as I could to help. And I, I was fortunate to be in in 12 step groups where you do yeah. have a lot of access to wonderful people. Of mm. course, you have to be careful about who you take your guidance from. But mm. I was I was determined enough to ask enough people where I could sift through the ones I didn't find helpful. And yeah, you know, I would call one person for certain advice, another for different advice. I did have a therapist, we had couples therapist. Mm -hmm. So all the different tools were there. Mm -hmm. And then the primary thing was, can I just sit with my own dis distress? <sighs> So that I don't make a decision from that place. And that was yeah. so incredibly hard. I yeah. think my sponsor always told me it's okay to decide not to decide. And that thing was so, that was so helpful for me. So mm. not rushing to, my thing was always, it's over. I'm out of here. I can't yeah. deal with this. It's never going to change. Yada, yada, yada. Yeah. And then once I, could calm down and sometimes it would take days or weeks even yeah and then i could start to see clearly you kind of mentioned that before is yeah being able to see things a little more clearly mm -hmm. and yeah having all those people around me mm -hmm. were so helpful and then learning mm. i think also what's hard for people is what's my shit mm -hmm. what's her shit mm -hmm. what's somewhat in the middle shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And and where to draw those lines in, in the sense of, wait a second, this, this conflict arising right now is not me primarily. And, and to be able to do that, right, very difficult. And you, you can't figure that out on your own, you need insight from other people. Yeah. And so that sort of navigating that maze or the um, mm -hmm. labyrinth is we, we need guides and we need help. And mm -hmm. then we can start to make more informed decisions. And I'd say one last thing about the kids. One question I often share with people to ask, and I asked myself this over and over was, can I, will I be able to look my kids in the eye 20 years from now and tell them I did everything I possibly could to make the marriage work with their mother? Mm, that's a good one. And, it is a good one. Of course, that can get, you know, you could sort of take that to the end where you punish yourself to a sense, but mm. that was a big one. And so that was one thing that helped me a lot. Mm. And then yeah, getting a lot of help from other people and yeah, being able to sit with the minotaur, you know, in that just pair of and, the and wrestle with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So that's sort of how it happened for me. And then mm. it, then we kind of got more integrated and, mm -hmm. you know, here we are now, things seem to be good, but yeah, life is life. And, but yeah, the team is super helpful. And the, the distress tolerance is very, a big one for me in particular, that was always something I was not good at. So yeah, just, yeah. That takes enormous courage. And in a way, that's an act of deep love to say, I'm going to suffer for you. I'm going to stay in this, even though I hate this and I hate you. I hate myself. <laughs> yeah. I'm in so much pain. I would, I've been trying to avoid this pain my whole life, but yes. for some reason, because I love you this much, I'm going to stay in it. That doesn't look like saying nice things or being kind. You might be really uncomfortable and crabby throughout that, but that's yeah. an act of love, right? Um, and I want to just add to that piece to make it even more concrete for people, Mike, because what you said is so, so important about not jumping to conclusions and making a decision right. reflexively. 
but also not staying indecisive forever, right? Because that causes right, its right, own right. problem. Uh, yeah. One thing I counsel people to do, especially when they come to me kind of late in the game, like, ah, we tried therapy, we did everything, yeah, ah, yeah. Stop me. I'm <laughs> out of here, but they're still torn, they haven't done it. Uh -huh. I say, pause for three months, work with me or work with somebody intensively, get all of these pieces, get the group, get a guide that you trust, work through these things that I tell you. You know, mm -hmm. know your know these wounds. Deal with the wounds. Look at those negative emotions. Process them, and then in those three months, just show up. Be do your best. Don't pretend. Your your partner knows in three months you might decide to leave. Don't hide it, but don't talk about it all the time. Don't talk about how you you oh, I can't be here. No, oh. it's not their problem. It's yours. Just show up. Love them mm -hmm. as best mm -hmm. as you can, however broken you are, however inadequate you feel. Just love them that way and try to get to know them in the time you have. Because let's say you do leave, you won't, have, you won't ever see them again or you won't be close to them ever again. So cherish the time that you have. Give yourself a deadline. Cher Both partners know this. You're not playing games. You're not threatening. And it's good for the other partner. Often the other side is they're incredibly insecure because they, they don't know if you're staying or going and they, they can't build their life. So when you yeah. say to them, I'm going to spend three months dealing with my own shit, not talking about it, but dealing with it proactively and showing up as best as I can. And I will make a decision. So you're not waiting for forever at the end of that three months. And honey, you can do whatever you want. I'm not going to put anything on you. You don't have to change. You don't have to fix yourself. We don't have to go to couples therapy. That could be part of it, but we don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to do my work. That, you know, that tells me that that man is ready to go further into intimacy and real love. If they're not willing to do that, they're just looking for an excuse, an easy way out. Um, that, you know, they, it's better for them to just walk away and, and, and suck it up and, and acknowledge they're not ready or willing because if the resources are there and you get them and you're not willing then it's not it's not a question of i can't it's a question of i won't yeah and that's fair too right like i i made that choice plenty of times but to actually own that um and then to own that i will and i and I, let's say i work on this for three months i do my best and then my partner decides to leave me ah well this is your question about what's their stuff and my stuff. I hear that all the time with, from men. And it's a great question. But to me, it's, it's like when I do Aikido, martial art, you and I would do Aikido together. It doesn't matter what's my stuff or your stuff. It doesn't matter what's your stuff, really. It, what matters is how I'm handling my stuff. Mm. Mm. That's what matters. And we're in relationship. I can't control you. Terry Crews once said, you can't love someone and control them at the same time. I trying to figure out your stuff so I can blame it or tell you it's 60% your fault. That's me trying to control you. Who cares? Let's say it's 90% your fault, objectively. And, you know, some right. therapists will tell you that if they're honest, they'll see the couple. But who cares? I'm going to deal with my 10% or my 100% what's real for me. And then I'm going to show up and then I can evaluate, say, well, I've done my work. You're still a jerk. Okay. I think I need to leave. <laughs> you know, I really do need yeah. to, leave. this is toxic, right? Like I, I, I'm, I'm being really loving and generous and I'm dealing with all my stuff and I'm imperfect. I make mistakes all the time, but I, re I try to repair and acknowledge and take ownership and you're still a jerk. Okay. Yeah. Now I know I can walk away with a clean heart. Mm -hmm. I think we get gummed up with that question as a way to avoid looking at ourselves, you know? It's yeah. Like, well, I think, but, but by figuring out your own shit and focusing yeah. that on that, then it becomes clear what is and what isn't, or it becomes more clear. Therefore you can sort of be clear enough, you know, right? Yeah. Clear enough or, or more clear like that. Actually, I don't think, or at least you can have a d dialogue around Oh, wait, maybe this isn't me so much. Maybe mm -hmm. this is you. And if you have two willing partners, which is also rare or not rare, but yeah, 
then you can have dialogue over and you get more clarity that way too. And I think what I think you're speaking to the other side that I just spoke to too, is that if you internalize negativity from people all the time, every time right. they're unhappy, you think it's your fault. And right, I think right, it's right. really good to be able to say, that's not my stuff. <laughs> it can't all be my stuff. That's pretty yeah, grandiose to think yeah, yeah, everything yeah. wrong with the world <laughs> is my fault. That's, that's kind yeah, of yeah. kooky. Right. So I think it's really healthy to push back at the same time for me. Like I've just found trying to figure out what's theirs is where is a trap, you know? Right. 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 Um, right. Yep. I like that I, distinction. I yeah. just got to figure out what doesn't belong here. Yeah. Yeah. And give it, give it back. Yeah. 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 I like Our, that. There's so much to talk about. Yeah, here. there is, there is, there is. And we'll have to continue another time. Yeah. Uh, well, Thank you, David. Maybe just share also where people can find the work you're doing and how they can find you. Yeah, I, I um, we're, we're a small community. We're, we're in Toronto and Ontario. We've got men all over uh, from the world also joining us online. Um, and you can find us at www.powerfulandloving.com. Powerful and loving the whole um, vision for our community comes from Martin Luther King's quote, power without love is reckless and abusive and love without power is sentimental and anemic. And mm -hmm. so we're just, we're just ordinary men trying to practice and study what does it mean to be powerful and love to live in that paradox, to show up fully and to be authentic and generous and kind and all of that. And, um, and you can find us there. And then if you're specifically on the fence or questioning your relationship, we have a whole series of videos, a choose your own adventure, which is a lot of fun where you, you watch different videos to follow different paths where I go through a ravine system and I, I walk you through your, your five options. Instead of two, you have five. And you can find that at powerfulloving.com slash stay or go. And that mm. will take you to this free training. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I hope we, you know, I hope one day we meet if we're meant to and if we're crossing paths, there's a, there's a whole wide world out there. And, and one last thing, I, I do recommend people watch this TED talk by David Brooks called The Second Mountain. It speaks to the relational paradigm that I've been talking about, where the first mountain is achievement and individual, me, 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 I'm important, blah, blah. We get to the peak at some point in our life and we realize what Carl Jung would say, what was true in the morning of my life becomes a lie in the afternoon. And on the other side of this peak, there's a whole world, a relational world where it's about us. It's about community and service and leadership and co-creation and intimacy and love and you know all the good stuff. So I encourage people to check that out. Amazing. yeah thanks so much mike it's been really yeah wonderful yeah indeed good to see you and uh i look forward to the next time